Good morning, One Turner Church family. Um, had some technical issues this morning. If you're joining us online, hopefully it's mostly fixed now. There's still a few things lingering in the background. Um, before I get into our message for today, just a reminder, some of you are expecting the updated nominating committee report to come out today. It will come out in the next couple of days. We're just finalizing a few names. So team leaders, if you need uh, names and con or rather contact details, because uh, some of your team members you may not have or you may not know them as well, by all means contact me. Um, something I do need to repeat that's in the newsletter. If you are sitting on the first three rows on this side and the first sort of six rows probably closer to that side, you see a little stick in the back. It says live stream capture zone. Now, that isn't too different from what we've already been doing. Um, what's up on the screen? Well, not this one, but when you see the camera angles, you may show up on the live stream, okay? So nothing different from what we've done before. Uh, we just wanted to you know that. It's just capturing the back of your head for the most part. Speaking of live stream, we do have, um, uh, we've been trying different camera angles. Um, oh, and by the way, but just one more thing. So that entire side, there is no live stream capture. Um, and Simone, the prayer team, and Paul, we might get you to pray on this side because we'll have some musicians playing in the background. So nothing too different from what we've already been doing. Just wanted to formalize that. I do want to uh, mention that we have regularly members, one Turner Church family who join us online. Uh, I want to mention Ellen and Eva from Tasmania. Uh, someone mentioned to me that if they were here locally, physically, they'd be joining us in person. So special shout out to you. Um, yes, because they will totally understand what that means. There are others that we see from time to time. But um, yeah, now one final thing before I start. Paul's already mentioned this. This was already in the newsletter. I promised Tanisha I won't embarrass her too much. She's right there. Um, Tanisha has basically been studying full-time full for the most part and working part-time as a YPW over two very difficult years uh, under COVID circumstances. Many things done behind the scenes, but uh, this is what Paul didn't say. She's stepping down because she's actually sick of me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's actually because she's sick of Dan. No, 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 she's pursuing a uh, work related to a future career path. But I just wanted to say, Tanisha, you're still at church. You'll still be around. I just want to say thank you and appreciate all that you've done. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, we will see you around. She's not going anywhere just as yet. All right, let's get into our message for today. Some of you are probably quite interested, um, especially if you hear what the topic is. But... I invite you to bow your heads and I'll kneel. Thank you, Simone, for the prayer. Um, I will basically do this out of habit more than anything else. So I'm going to kneel. Let's pray and we'll start. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you once again for this opportunity to come before you in worship. Lord, my prayer remains the same each week, that you would hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. And Lord... May you not just open our minds, may you open our hearts as well as we open your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we are at the tail end of our Facts, Fables, Formalities, and Foundations series. It's been designed, I guess, somewhat intentionally for the two sermons that I'm preaching to sort of be bookends of the series. And our series have been a little bit different in the sense that we wanted to give you, I guess, some tools, some methods uh, in which you can discover things about the Bible, things about Jesus by yourself, especially there's a myriad of information out there that's easily accessible. Now, I'll do a recap next week, but for today, I want to start by just reminding you of, I guess... Um, to hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, very loosely defined, is how you interpret what the Bible says. Now, scholars will say to me, what you are sharing isn't strictly hermeneutics. That's probably correct. But what I'm trying to say is that if you apply the right approach, you will come to the right conclusions and the right interpretation. Okay? In fact, I think that today's sermon has more of a, a lecture feel to it. Um, not so much that it's a information dump, it's not. 
Maybe it's more of a Bible study than, than an actual sermon presentation. The structure is a little bit different. You'll see what I mean. Maybe you won't. But uh, let me do a quick revision of the two things that we've talked on so far. Two, I guess, approaches to hermeneutics. See if you remember this. I mentioned this in our first sermon four or five weeks ago now. It starts with C and rhymes with consistency. Okay, consistency, 10 points. So when you approach the Bible, you have to practice consistency in how you approach it. And we talked about this um, in the sermon called I Am a Christian. And of course, Wendy, when she preached about uh, the God of love who sends you to hell, we discovered that that statement is inconsistent. So we have to approach a consistent, uh, we have to take a consist, consist, take a consistent approach to understanding biblical topics. Um, obviously, God of love doesn't send you to hell. In fact, hell is an incorrectly understood concept. Now, the second word starts with P and rhymes with priority. That's right, it's priority. How we come to biblical terms and definitions is we have to put things in the right order. And we talked about this in our sermon, Seventh-day Adventists versus Christian, and when Dan talked about once saved, always save. So if you missed the sermons, you can go to our YouTube channel. We're going to continue building on these principles, these hermeneutics, these approaches in discovering facts, fables, formalities, and foundations as we continue with our topic today. The title of the presentation today is Women Shouldn't Lead in Church. How many of you believe that to be true? Do not raise your hand, at least not yet. Um, how many of you are like, it's Yoshi, it's a clickbait title? You know, clickbait is a title that seemingly says something, but doesn't actually, you know, just to get you to click on it, to get you to, to you know, that's not what it says. Well, why don't we just start by reading the Bible, okay, and seeing what it actually says. It's clear as day. I'm going to ask my beautiful wife to come up to read a passage which 100% settles this. It will settle this matter once and for all. She looks very excited. Now, just in case you think it's, I'm making this up, go to your Bible and read from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 to 35, okay? I'm gonna put it up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 to 35. I'm gonna, well, I'll give you the version. It's a new international version, just in case you think I'm making this stuff up. All right, go ahead, honey. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. As the law says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. And the church said... <laughs> you know there's a reason why it's a men and not a... Yeah. Some of you are like, come on, come on. Let me give you a direct translation. The King James, sometimes some of us prefer, prefer the King James Version. This is literally what the King James actually says. So, please continue, my wife. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. Sorry, okay, sorry I missed that part. Can you say that again? They are what? No. As also saith the law, <laughs> they are commanded to be under obedience. As also saith the law, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Thank you, wife. <laughs> Let's have a closing prayer. I mean, man, I, I mean, man, we're talking about leading? That's not even talking about leading. This shouldn't even speak in church. The Bible says, literally, it, it, check your Bibles. I'm, I'm not making this up. A, not woman, men. We're done here, right? Well, we're not. In fact, since we're in Corinthians, um, there are a couple of things we're going to implement as well, because thus saith the Lord. Have you heard that saying before? Thus saith the Lord, it's clear, they quote a Bible verse to you, and therefore it must be true. Here's one, here's one. 
1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. <laughs> I am mandating, as the pastor of this church, that half of everything that you collect in the offering bag now goes to me. Where's Mark? Mark's probably watching us online now. Good idea, Mark. Mark's our church treasurer. Because, well, I mean, it's permissible, and it's also beneficial. So let's do it, right? All in favor? Oh, you guys. Here's another, here's another one. Here's another one. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. We had a couple of new, newly engaged couples, time to break off the engagement, because it is good for a man not to marry. In fact, here's what the rest of the chapter says. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. So Paul is saying, don't get married. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undevoted devotion to the Lord. All you selfishly married people out there with your divided devotion to God, shame on you. We better literally take Paul at what he says, right? Tough crowd. One more. I guarantee you'll have no problems with this because you'll absolutely love this. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 12. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a... Holy kiss. So make sure you put your mask down. And instead of a handshake... Now, I apologize for my obvious facetiousness. But I've seen the Bible used in exactly just this way to justify. I could get in trouble, but I'm just going to say it for what it is. I've used the Bible used in this way to justify some bigoted, misogynistic, preconceived opinions, and I suppose it bothers me. It bothers me. There is no consistency in the approach. There's no priority in matters of faith. And worst of all, it misrepresents Christ and who he is. So our message today, I guess, is very simple. You know, we've talked about how people build their foundations out of fables and formalities. I could probably throw another F word in there, flippancy. Sometimes people build foundations out of just flippancy. They see a passage, it agrees with their preconceived ideas, it agrees with their conclusion, and they go around and take it and just bam, bam, bam. Now, my presentation today isn't just actually about women in the church. That is the platform that I'm using, okay? But it goes beyond that. So in some ways, the reason why I say it's more like a lecture today is because we're going to look at a few things on how to actually come to some conclusions about the Bible. There are three things for you to remember in addition to consistency and priority. I should mention this too. Inevitably, if you're hearing some of these verses that I've quoted for the first time, and perhaps even other parts of the Bible, you will be discouraged, you will be confused, you'll be wondering, why are some things in the Bible so complicated? Complicated. Why can't it be laid out just clearly for us? You know, I mean, do you need to go to and get a master's degree in theology to be able to understand and preach? The answer is actually no. I want to counter, I guess, foundations that are based on fables and flippancy. And there are three points I want to share with you today. Three very simple points. As I mentioned, we're using Women Shouldn't Lead in Church as a platform for our discussion. I'm going to give these three to you very quickly. I'm going to tell you what they are. We're going to apply them to a couple of passages, okay? And then we'll close, in the, close with the story. So that's our, the rest of our presentation today. So um, here are the three in relative quick succession. 
The first is culture, the second is context. So culture is asking the what, like what's the situation surrounding the passage that we're reading, okay? And context is asking the why, as in why did the author of the Bible say what he said? What is his purpose, his reasoning, his rationale? And once we have culture and context, we can then come to the conclusion referring to how it applies to us. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a Bible study journey today, okay? Um, it's actually quite simple. We will go back to the passage that my beautiful wife read earlier. Obviously, it was intentional that I got her to read it because uh, it captures your attention. Um, but I do want to take a slight detour um, to set the stage a bit more before we get to these passages. You know, initially, my sermon was going to be just about why women should lead in the church because that's an actually that's actually a very easy case to make. It's actually a very, very easy case to make. Um, I feel like that would be cheating almost, but I'm going to give you just one slide on all the women leaders in the Bible. Very clearly, all right? Let me give you biblical facts. Let's start with one of the most prominent Old Testament women leaders. Her name is Deborah. In Judges 4 and verse 4, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. Some versions translate it as judging. So she was literally the president or the prime minister, if you, want to equ- if you want to equate that today. And she was so competent in all areas of leadership that Barak, who was, I guess, part of the leadership team, says, I'm not going to go to war without you. Like, if you don't go, I'm not going. Here's another one. Micah chapter 6 and verse 14. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. So often we talk about Moses and Aaron being leaders, but Miriam was also a leader. Third in command, if you want to call it that. 2 Kings chapter 22 talks about Huldah, the prophetess, who admonished King Josiah in Israel. You know, uh, Josiah's like, I don't know who to go to. We need to consult Halda, and they did. And of course, we have an entire book of the Bible devoted to Queen Esther, the queen who saved a nation. And there are a number of others, a number of others which I'm not going to list here. Anna, the prophetess, Phoebe, who was a leader, a diakonos, a deacon, translated servant in some passages. Lydia, who was a successful businesswoman and leader in her own right. Priscilla with Aquila, who many scholars believe were the early house church leaders. In fact, it's basically preposterous in my mind, especially if you're Adventist, to say that women shouldn't lead in church because who is one of the founders of our church? Ellen White, not a trick question. Ellen White. White. So so I was going to design my entire sermon around that, and I thought, that's just cheating. (laughs) That's just cheating. (laughs) It's, It's easy, easy, right? But here comes the challenge. Here comes the challenge. Um, Oh, by the way, I have found that people who are against women leaders are also the strongest proponents of Ellen White, which just just kind of baffles me a little bit. Does it not? I'm like, women shouldn't be leaders in the church because Ellen White says, and like, anyway, that's that's another story all that's another story altogether. but here's the challenge, right? So I'm, I'm, I changed the direction of my sermon a little bit as I was rehearsing because inevitably there are some passages in the Bible like the ones that we've read that cause some level of concern. Now, I, our non-believer friends would go, yeah, it's inconsistent. Can we reconcile some of these passages? We build doctrine based on what the Bible says in its entirety, okay? So the majority says this, but there are always a handful of things we we need to go, okay, can we, do we just ignore them? Um, In fact, you know, you might go, Yoshi, you talk about consistency. Paul isn't very consistent, is he? Paul the apostle, you know, he talks about, yeah, women should be silent. But in in Galatians, he says, uh, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor free nor slave, neither male nor female. Everyone's equal. And yet Paul says, women be silent. Like, what, what gives 
Can we even trust the Bible if it's so inconsistent? The answer for that actually isn't that complicated. The answer isn't actually that complicated. Context and culture, we ask the what, we ask the why, and then we come to the conclusion, how does it apply? I want to say one more thing before we break it down. Only some passages are complicated. Only some. Because the important ones, the ones that, for example, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Very simple, right? Here's another one. Love one another. Very simple. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. For by grace you are saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2. So those are simple. What we're going to do today is we're going to do a Bible study to look at a couple of difficult passages, some passages that require a bit more digging, things where culture and context can change the meaning entirely. What do I mean? Now, here's an example that I've used before, and I've shared with you some of you this before, right? Um, I think I used this last year. I can't remember. Let me put up two very simple words on the screen. That's sick. Now, what does this mean? Immediately, some of you have some perhaps not so nice pictures in your head of a scenario or situation that could be described by those two words. Perhaps you're thinking of milk that is three months overdue. That it's no longer milk, it's more not milk. And instead of flows out, it clumps out. And then I record a video where I take it and I go, oh. <laughs> you would go, that's sick. You should be glad that um, I decided to not illustrate with pictures, <laughs> just, just words, all right? There are plenty of exa other examples, unspeakable ones that would cause you to warrant uh, the description, that's sick. However, consider this. Imagine if I were to tell you right now that I'm going to, in my suit, in this stage right now, do a backflip. I'm going to look at this side of the room, okay? If you want to get your cameras out, here we go. No, I'm not going to. Just for the sake of argument, you imagine that I've done it. Shawnee, you would say, that's sick. Some of you are looking at me a little bit incredulously. It's okay, I don't really speak young people as well, so talk to Shawnee and this side of the room. <laughs> Because if I were to do a double backflip and then land on my feet and continue preaching to this side, you would go, that's sick. There are plenty of examples in the Bible where a word can have, uh, just take a step back, plenty of examples in just society in general where culture and context changes the meaning entirely. Here's a few, right? Okay, so, um, oops. Is it finished? Completed? Or is it finished? Someone left, as in they departed? Or there's someone left, and they remained? It buckled? Or it's buckled? So understanding things within context is very, very important. And the reason why we decided to do this series, Facts, Fables, Formalities, Foundation, is to kind of build up a toolbox for us to understand what the Bible says, because otherwise you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Women should be silent. The pastor should have half of the church's salary. Greet each other with holy kiss. Men should remain single because it's good for them. Otherwise, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. So now we're going to go back to the, two pass the passage that we start off with that I got Nadia to read. Okay? Women should remain silent. You ask the question, what is the culture of the time? I'm going to give this to you really, really quickly. This is stuff that you can find on the internet or in the library anywhere. The culture of the time is simply this. It is a patriarchal society, meaning that it's one dominated by men. So both Greek and Jewish custom dictated that women should be kept in the background in public affairs. That's the culture. 
That's the culture that was prevalent then. The content, well, why? Why Paul said it is that violation of this custom will be looked upon as disgraceful and will bring reproach upon the church. So this has got nothing to do with women. It has to do with just making sure the church isn't misrepresented for what is happening at that point in time. In fact, in Corinth, there were plenty of places of worship that were not Christian, that had temple prostitutes, and they were the ones that were the loudest. So Paul is also not just protecting the reputation of the church, he's protecting the reputation of the women. Now, once we understand the culture and the context, we can then ask the question, how does it apply to us? Well, the principle is about how we want to present our church to the community. Here's a modern-day application. You ready? Some of you will not agree with this. Close the church during a pandemic and respect the five-kilometer lockdown radius. Have you gone on the internet and seen, we must fight for freedom, we must, you know. It's okay. Those things are okay. But we can worship at home, and we follow. Now, there comes a time, I'm going to do a side caveat here. There comes a time when we need to speak for our faith and what we believe in. But the principle here really is cultivating the right attitude and application. Otherwise, we miss the bigger picture. That's why 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 to 35 can be used to say something which was not meant to say at all. You know, we can, we can um, apply this idea of context, culture, and conclusion to any other foundation we're trying to make. Um, I said earlier that our topic of women shouldn't lead in church is the platform for our discussion. And the reason why I chose it is because, unfortunately, we have real-life scenarios of, I'm just going to call it what I think it is, misogynism disguised as biblical piety. It's almost as if they've made up their mind about something and then using the Bible to prove their point. They've gone, conclusion? Who cares about culture and context? Priorities are wrong. Let me look at one more passage, and I'm going to close with the story, all right? Two arguments that I hear a lot. Women shouldn't lean in the church. There were no female priests in the Old Testament, and there were no female disciples in the New Testament. Therefore, there should be no female pastors or leaders. Now, there's so many things I can say about this. I can give you the passages, you know. And you go like, hey, that's a common sense. I'll tell you what. The Bible doesn't say you need to wear a suit and tie while you're preaching either. In fact, the Bible doesn't say you can't wear shorts and a singlet while I preach. How many of you would take me seriously if I preach here with my boxes and a, and a singlet? Oh, good. Some of you will. Thank you for that. But culturally, probably less so, right? Some of you will be okay if I took off my tie and just preach. You'll be okay with that. But in some places, if I didn't have my tie on, some of you might be okay if I put on a skirt, will you? but you would be if I was Samoan. We can go straight to culture and context, which I'll talk on very, very quickly. But let's just start with, let's take a slight step back and talk about consistency. If you want to use the Old Testament criteria for priests and the New Testament criteria for disciples to exclude women, then you need to be consistent in all your criteria. What do I mean? Here's the criteria for an Old Testament priest. You had to be male. Right? That's the Bible says that. There were no female priests. You had to be male. And so many times people go, see, pastors should be only male because they were all males in uh, the Old Testament priesthood. But what people conveniently leave out is male, uh, not only were they male, they were Jewish. That was a criteria. And not only any sort of Jewish uh, tribe, you had to be from a specific tribe called the tribe of Levi. And here's one which I've never heard anyone say. To be a priest, to be a pastor, you must be, you know. So by this definition, I couldn't be a pastor or a priest because I'm male, but I'm not any of the others. Okay, you know what I mean. <laughs> T 
TMI, sorry, I just, that just came out. <laughs> so when you factor in culture, um, consistency, right? Now, we factor in culture and context. Let's start with culture. What is the situation with the Levites chosen as priests? Um, God had chosen one specific tribe from out of the others to be responsible as mediators for his people. That's the culture. That was the surrounding. God did it. And why did God do that is because the Levites were always faithful, including in the incident with the golden calf that they chose not to participate in. So God stipulated that only Levites could be priests, and that means this issue of Old Testament priesthood isn't about male or female, it's about calling. It's about calling. The conclusion that we can come to, how does it apply? God has a calling for you to be faithful to His calling and follow His appointments for you in your life. I'm just giving you two examples, and many examples you can apply the same principle, context, culture, and conclusion, factoring consistency and priority. In fact, there are, sometimes you just need to cross-check with other parts of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, for example, says this, but you are a chosen people, speaking to everyone, male and female. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You know, it's ironic that such a powerful thing, uh, such a powerful calling of the Old Testament priesthood is used by people to effectively stop someone else's calling. And that's why it bothers me. <laughs> honestly, honestly speaking, I've been honest this entire time, but honestly speaking, I wasn't entirely sure how to approach this topic or even if I should at all. Um, I'm actually almost even troubled that we even need to discuss this topic. Some of you who follow our World Church, World Seventh-day Adventist Church at large, this issue of ordination, we, we're not going to go there today. Um, how, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a big issue, but let me, just, let me just be very, very clear in this issue of calling. Women should be leaders in our church. Women should be pastors. Women should be the halders who lead God's people, who consult with kings. Women should be the Deborahs, the Esthers, and the Ellen Whites leading our church where God has called them specifically to be, and yet there are the unfortunate few who have gone out to limit this calling. I agree, not every woman is called to be a pastor or a leader, just like not every man is called to be a pastor or a leader. But why limit the calling of those who are? There was a time when I was... Uh, Maybe not quite angry or upset, but not far off. Now I'm just sad for how some of our foundations have been developed. We are better than this. Men, we need to support our women in ministry, in leadership, especially in the local church. I could keep going. Why don't we close with a story? When I was at Andrews um, doing my theology degree, um, we have guest speakers that show up on campus all the time, some formally invited, others informally invited. We, I remember one particular speaker, um, very, 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 I guess, I don't want to use the word conservative because I've been called conservative, very one side, okay? Uh, not invited by the university itself, but invited by a small group of... Don't say the word that's on your mind, Yoshi. By a small group of people. Let's go with that. <laughs> this particular speaker was from a certain male-centered culture where females have very little say, and that's his culture. I'm okay with that. What wasn't fine, I guess, for me personally, was him coming to Andrews 
and basically calling out, calling out every single female student who was studying theology there. Every single one. He hired out a hall and packed it, and I remember sitting in one of his presentations, and honestly, it felt more like a rant than a presentation. Um, I, I didn't stay for the whole thing. He even wrote a book, which is sold. He, he was talking about how women are full of pride and just want to elevate themselves, and that's why they're pastors, right? They want to elevate themselves to superiority. And what really caught me was that, oh, they want to make more money and so that they can get tax exemptions. And I'm like, okay. Um, it was just interesting. Anyway, I, I didn't stay for the whole thing. I had a classmate, we'll call her Jennifer, that's not her real name. Um, classmate, we're not close friends, acquaintances. I had gotten to know Jennifer because we had started in the same cohort, we had shared our ministry journey. And, and Jennifer, I think, was at the presentation, and she knew about it, so I said, you know, what do you think? And I expect her to be upset. Um, and she said something to me, which, which I'll never forget. I'll, show, I'll tell you what she said in a moment, but let me tell you where she's come from, okay? So Jennifer was um, about my age in the 30s, right? She was single. She's now married. And she used to be a bank manager driving a BMW at one of the largest bank branches in America. Now, she told me this after much pressure because I could kind of put two and two together. And so I wanted to approach her going, well, what do you think, right? You become a pastor to have prestige and make more money. <laughs> what do you think? Expecting him to honestly take my very cynical and... Uh, but, he, but she taught me a powerful lesson. She taught me a powerful lesson. Um, this is what she said. I'm here because God... Call me here. That's it. No big argument. She wasn't upset. And she's there because God called her. The foundation that Jennifer decided was the most important thing is that God called her. I was quite humbled <laughs> because here I am, I'm going to be righteous and just fight for the women. You know, I, I don't consider myself a feminist in any way, shape, or form. I'm like, I'm just going to go on. But, but God called her to preach the gospel, and she was there for there, that alone. I feel church, and it breaks my heart that as a church, we are more concerned about all those other things as our foundations and the calling that God has given you and to me. What has God called you to do? I'm not talking about official church positions or whatever it is. What has God called you to do? It's a question that I hope you can take away as you ponder your foundations on why you believe what you believe and why you have the opinions that you have. You're looking at the Bible within culture and context to shape your thoughts, or are you reshaping the Bible to fit your predisposed ideas? <laughs> have you decided on your conclusion with no regard to context, culture, consistency, priority? If you have, the only person that loses out is actually you. As I invite the praise and worship team to come up, I want to leave you with this. This idea of calling. You know, each of us have a different calling, a different purpose in our life. Some of you are new to this whole journey with God. Some of you have been baptized and attended church for a very long time. Whatever your calling is, do not let man-made structures and opinions, do not let me stifle your calling. If I have done that, I apologize. Do what God has called you to do. Even if everybody says no, or if they say you're not good enough. We are to rely on God's voice to guide us. Culture, context, conclusion finding the calling and putting Jesus at the center of it all.